Thank you. It's, uh, it's good to be here at the uh, reunion of the graduating class of the School of Human Liberation. <laughs> And, and it's uh, particularly gratifying to be introduced by my dear friend Barbara Lee, my sister as I call her, who uh, has been a partner for so many years in the Congress of the United States, uh, in her own right a significant leader for peace, for social, and for economic justice. Uh, the work for the Department of Peace uh, HR 808, uh, work which I began on the, by introducing the legislation on July the 11th, 2001, two weeks, two months before 9-11. Uh, that work is going to be uh, carried forward by Barbara Lee and she will prepare to introduce the uh, legislation under the auspices of a Department of Peace building. And uh, Barbara, there is no one in the Congress of the United States who is better prepared to carry that torch forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You have the best Congress person in America, and you know that. And I just want you to know that I know that. I also want to once again uh, recognize my uh, good friend, uh, uh, Mayor Newport. Uh, he. Uh, when he was mayor of Berkeley, I was mayor of Cleveland, Bernie Sanders was mayor of Burlington. And uh, we've, uh, we've stayed true to our commitments, and, and Gus, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, Jackie uh, Cabasso called me a month ago and said, uh, this is an anniversary that's very important to us, and we would love to have you uh, come out. Uh, this is uh, only the second appearance that I've made since uh, uh, leaving office and because I really wanted time to basically you know, absorb the experience of moving from public life into private life. Uh, I'll give you a quick report. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not ready yet, Mark. <laughs> and, and when Jackie asked, I, I said instantly, of course, you know, I, I want to be here. Uh, uh, and I, but the main reason why I did it is because she asked because uh, she has had such a tremendous commitment to, uh, to getting rid of nuclear weapons and to a larger architecture of peace uh, that um, I had to be here to support your efforts, Jackie. Please join me in, in recognizing same platform with Daniel Ellsberg, who is someone who I've long admired, uh, who is a, has been a friend for many years, and who my uh, wife and I have had the opportunity to uh, share uh, many evenings with Dan and his wife uh, to talk about the direction that, uh, what, what an authentic America would look like. Um, Dan, uh, you're, oh there you are, hi right, Dan. Thank, thank you. It's just great to be here with this, uh, on this platform. And you and I will have a chance to participate together in a panel a little bit. Thank you so much, Dan. And, and thank you for who you are. Thank you. Um, I, I was with, I was with uh, David and Carol Lee Krieger uh, 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 a few days ago in Santa Barbara. And of course, the uh, Nuclear Age Peace Foundation has done work which uh, in, in, has actually been in alignment with the work that Jackie has done. And uh, we spent a lot of time talking about uh, Father Louis. <laughs> and Father, Father, Louis, Father Louis living the faith and, and really in a way that Because the prayer is, make me a channel of your peace. That's how the prayer of St. Francis begins. It's a prayer that my wife and I uh, recited to each other when we were married. Uh, Elizabeth, by the way, uh, sends her, her best wishes. Uh, she has just premiered a major documentary that she produced uh, at the Berlin Film Festival just hours ago, and it's called, uh, you'll hear about it, it's called G-M-O-O-M-G. <laughs> uh, 
So we, so we're busy. But you know, as, I, as I'm here with this wonderful community, uh, renewing friendships and connections from over the years, and I can look throughout the audience and identify dozens of people here who I've known for many years, uh, I'm thinking about our collective experience. I'm thinking about uh, going way back, how many of us remember the, the good old days of duck and cover. How, uh, you know, I, how, many, how, how many of you, when you were children, had nightmares about the nuclear attack that was coming? Look at the hands, okay? As children. Now, let me share with you mine. Uh, the missiles were always going to come at recess. <laughs> I mean, think about it, you know, you're in the second, third grade, recess, chocolate milk, I mean, I'm a vegan now, it doesn't do me any good, but, and, but the missiles are always coming at recess, and they just blow up your recess. And of course, we understood why they held those duck and cover drills was basically an exercise in tension reduction, because there was no place to duck and cover. Uh, there, was, there was a particular crouch they taught you that had some dark humor to it, but um, and but we know it's not funny. Years later, I had the opportunity to, uh, as a private citizen, visit Russia for a meeting with the members of the Russian Academy of Sciences. And as the plane broke through the clouds, over uh, uh, about thirty miles outside of Moscow. As we were approaching Chermatevo Airport, I saw the Russian countryside for the first time. And it looked like a scene out of Pennsylvania a uh, hundred years ago. Very humble dachas, you know, with small fences bordering uh, their, their, their land. And at that moment, when I, when I saw what was the apparent uh, humility of people and how they lived. I was overwhelmed. And I began to cry just spontaneously. Because I thought, you know, we almost annihilated each other. And meeting with members of the Russian Academy of Sciences uh, who had worked on the atomic bomb project, who could describe in very intimate and elaborate terms the science behind the bomb, and what they saw was the beauty of the science behind the bomb. Um, and also the understanding of the horror of the application of that science. Um, I had the chance to be one of the first Americans in the secret city where the bomb was developed, where workers who had built the, the housing for the, uh, for the development of, the, of, of that uh, reactor uh, some of them had fallen into the into a pit and they just walled them off. They, they were gone. Um, remember the ghost, ghostly green colors of the inside of that reactor, which you know, had been closed many years since then. Um, and the thing that impressed me in that first visit that I made to Russia more than 20 years ago was the common humanity of the people and the common destiny that we share. There are many activists in this audience. And my opportunity to be an activist uh, in many different ways, Jack, you know, I, uh, Ohio has a nuclear power plant, which you might be familiar with. It's called Davis Bessie. Mm -hmm. and, and I was out there protesting the building of it when it was, when the license was granted. And then we brought people together to point out uh, how not only was it not needed, but that it, that uh, they were building it right on Lake Erie. And, you know, the largest supply of fresh water in the world through the Great Lakes. Uh, Thirty-five years later, that still continuing that effort. With Davis Bessie being one of the plants that has had so many serious problems that, uh, you know, we tried to cancel the license, shut it down. Um, I know that uh, in California, we've had several plants here that people here have been active on. And as a member of Congress, I've supported those efforts. Um, also, to try to protect the land of Native peoples, which is being poisoned by uh, uranium mining. I mean, this is another kind of the process, it's a, it's a whole process. Uh, and, um, of 
created a battle royal over the issue of nuclear loan guarantees. Wall Street won't finance nuclear power anymore, but they want the government to ante up $60 billion in loan guarantees. So we're, we're doing everything we can to challenge that. We're getting some help from the other side of the aisle, which is surprising. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, if you believe in a free market, right? Hello? <laughs> right? So, uh, and then something that Jackie and I talked about uh, just before I left Congress, somebody came up with the idea that, you know, we ought to honor the bomb. Oh yeah, with a national park named after the Manhattan Project. But there's not going to be an exhibit that would show the destruction at Hiroshima or Nagasaki. This is all about the glorification and celebration of a technology that is uh, that has been implicated in uh, not just the destruction of, of, of hundreds of thousands of people, but as a sort of Damocles that is poised over the entire world. Um, fortunately, there's no walk in the atomic bomb park here. We're, we're talking about a whole different approach to life here. So, when Einstein came up with his theory, uh, E equals MC squared, he had actually studied philosophy broadly, including the Hindu philosophy. Uh, which, from, from which uh, some have written that he uh, was able to borrow liberally from uh, in terms of his uh, ideas with respect to the uh, laws of conservation of matter. Because uh, if you look at the Hindu philosophy, the, uh, the, the concept of yanam, shakti, and tapasya, they really speak of we are the, are the energy of the stars. And the energy of the stars is made us. So that interchangeability between matter and spirit is, is recognized as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a physical principle and as a spiritual principle as well. Uh, the, um, and so there is no separation then of spirit and matter. That spirit descends to sanctify matter, matter ascends to become spirit. I'm not talking about religion, I'm talking about something much deeper. I'm talking about a, a consciousness and awareness of, of the order of things, about the interpenetration of matter and spirit, about really the sanctification of the material world. And the, that, that, it is, that it is good, that it is holy, that's the, that's the implicate state that's the intention if we have it. Uh, and when you see the, the, the unity of matter and spirit, you can understand why the human genome theory determined that we're all 99.9% .9 made of the same stuff. There, the, there's an underlying unity in everything. And of course our unity is with the natural world. We, we learn from the romantic poets. Wordsworth talked about, in his uh, Ode on Intimations of Immortality, he talks about the glory of the flower. The, and, and in that, in a single flower, being able to comprehend the exquisite beauty of nature and, and our connection to that natural world. The, um, there, there is a, a design in that natural world that, uh, like a fractal, reflects the designs in all of human, in all of human nature, in, in, in all of our experience. Uh, if it was the music of the spheres, it was made into a score with color and majesty. The poet, James Russell Lowell, in his uh, poem about the month of June, uh, talked about the expressive power of nature that is imminent in everything. He, he spoke of 
every piece of earth, where every clod feels a stir of might, an instinct within it that reaches and towers, and groping blindly above it for light, climbs to a soul in grass and flowers. The soul of the world in which, in which we are contained is a place of, of life and energy and beauty. And if you think of, of another poet, uh, Keats, what did he say? He said that uh, beauty is truth. Think of our inheritance. That that we have been we have been given a world where there is yes we understand the problems of the world but but there's something innate in the world there's something innate in life that is so beautiful and that's our that is our truth and it connects us to joy and that we're you know contrary to what uh, Matthew Arnold wrote in understanding the grim experiences of World War One when he said uh, love let us be true to one another. For this world before us has neither hope nor joy nor certitude nor flight from pain and we are here in a darkling plain swept by confusion alarm of struggle and flight where ignorant armies clash at night that is a reality but it is not it is not our inheritance it's part of what man creates but it is not and need not be fundamental to who we are. <clears throat> we learn that from spiritual principles that uh, we are our brother and sister's keeper, but we go beyond that to a new understanding which says there is no separation between ourselves and our brothers and sisters, that we're one, that we are our brothers, we are our sisters, we are our neighbors. There is no other. The other is a, a construct of a subject-object orientation that has alienated us from some deeper meaning about who we are. And, and so, when we speak of we then, there is no separation of time and space. The founders understood that when they talked about we the people. The fate of the, per of the individual and the group is the same. That's an underlying meaning of, of the words uh, e pluribus unum, the first motto of the United States. Out of many, we are one. The paradox of singularity and multiplicity. The fact of the matter is that we have the ability to function as a group, we can attain, uh, retaining our individual integrity, but understanding that the choices that we make, as we choose, so chooses the world. But then we see the schism. The schism that is visited upon us by dichotomized thinking. The us versus them, whoever they are. The rich versus poor, black versus white. Communist versus, demo communist versus democracy. You can, you can make a catalog of, of all the us versus them. And I, I believe that that type of thinking derives from and, and was accelerated by the splitting of the atom, which produced a split in the material world and which helped to perpetuate this dichotomous thinking. And so we're, we're gripped by these misunderstandings. A misunderstanding of the nature of the material world. You would think when you see people fight over budgets that the material world keeps shrinking. But astrophysicists know that it's expanding at a tremendous rate. Uh, you would think that we're running out of money all the time and we're on a verge of a new austerity. But the truth of the matter is the Constitution under Article 1, Section 8 makes it abundantly clear that we do have the power to coin and create money to meet the needs of the country. And, and not just forfeit it to the Federal Reserve and to use it for the private banks and accelerate the wealth of the nation upwards. That doesn't have to happen. 
we're told we're running out of energy. What? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, think about it. Here's the headlines from the weekend edition, uh, not of Saturday Night Live, but of the uh, Investors Business Daily. Here's the headline. Petroleum exports soar to a new high in economic boost. Cheaper oil, natural gas, okay? Petroleum exports rose 9% versus November to a record 11.6 billion, up 1,056% from December 1999. Hydraulic fracking also has unlocked more natural gas. Uh, there's a, uh, a cheap, Oil and natural gas will benefit a variety of other energy-intensive sectors. There's, there's talk here, I'm, I'm not making this up. Uh, one of the things they're celebrating is the possibility of reshoring toilet manufacturing, which requires a lot of heat to bake ceramics. Well, you know, I mean, we all do those things and we can make them in the United States, but it's hardly a reason to uh, stay with the same energy policies. Uh, the International Energy Agency is predicting fracking will help the U.S. become the world's top oil producer in the next several years. The International Energy Agency sees U.S. oil production of 10 million barrels per day in 2015 growing to 11.1 uh, million in 2020. So for a while we'll be outstripping uh, production that Saudi Arabia has. Now. Um, What's the relevance of that? Well, it's obvious. We, we are wedded to forms of energy which are creating disunity in the world by creating wealth, accelerating into the hands of the few. And what's that wealth? It's not only the physical monetary wealth, but it's also the wealth of the natural world. The natural world is being cartelized. Our air, our water, our land, the, the, the pristineness, the purity of it is being sacrificed <coughs> What, what we own, our common heritage, the common wealth of the nation, is being cartelized to create wealth for a few at the expense of the many. We're told we don't have any other choices. Uh, if that kind of idea was around a uh, hundred years ago, uh, we'd still be riding around on horses, which you know may not be a bad idea. Uh, but uh, it belies the fact that there is a technological evolution that's always occurring. And we know it is occurring in many areas of alternative energy, but we also know that those, those areas are constantly under attack by the very industries that are profiting from the spoilation of our air, our water, and our land. So we have you know, a misunderstanding of the nature of the material world, um, and a misunderstanding of the nature of power. The truth is, that as, common, as citizens of a, with a common heritage, of a common planet, there must be power for all for none. Each one of us has this expressive power that the poet talked about, and this instinct within it, in us that reaches and towers, and we also have a common claim to the common heritage of a common planet. And yet, because there's a misunderstanding of the nature of power, power has become more and more identified with material wealth and with arms. If you don't have arms, you're not powerful. If you don't have a nuclear weapon, you're not powerful. If you don't have a lot of money and have a central bank, you're not powerful. Where did we get these ideas? And so because of this misunderstanding of the nature of the material world, misunderstanding of the application of power, we have a misapplication of technology. The development of nuclear technology, the weaponization of nuclear technology, the drilling, the mining, the fracking, all about extraction and exploitation, causing the planet to suffer, causing human beings' health to uh, be ruined, as if this is the only choice we have. So what happens? So we become alienated from our very Mother Earth. The preconditions of life, which are so essential for supporting the maintenance and the maintenance of life on the planet, are being eroded 
Because we are told that we must accept this as the only path that we can take forward. And this dichotomous thinking, this separation from nature, uh, can only breed aggression and hate, and it does. And so we lose control under such circumstances. The technology is out of control, and it's a loss of self-control. It's what the po poet Yeats wrote about when he, in his poem, The Second Coming. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. All things fall apart, the center cannot hold. The center's not holding right now. Because we have a misunderstanding of the nature of the material world, a misunderstanding of the, of the uh, use of power, and, and a misunderstanding of our ability to be able to work in harmony with the planet and the ecosystems so that we're not ruining it, we could actually repair it and, and work with it and move forward. But we're not doing that. Uh, the 60 years ago, the then uh, new head of the United Nations, uh, Doc Hammarskjöld, uh, talked about how it's our responsibility to be masters of, of the world and history and not be mastered by it. He was really talking about the ability of, of human beings to be able to be captains of their own fate. Uh, Marshall McLuhan, in his writings, talks about the problem when technology is out of control. It goes, uh, instead of uh, people, a person being, in, on, you know, technology being a saddle that uh, you put on a horse and you ride, the saddle gets put on us. Think about that. The saddle, this is what McLuhan said, the saddle gets put on us. Alfred North Whitehead said, you know, the greatest technological developments in society are processes that all but destroy the society in which they occur. So these are, this is thinking that is not uh, particularly new, but I'm here to tell you that we, have, we are heirs and heiresses of, of philosophy that can push back that could say that we reject this anatomy of human destructiveness, which uh, Eric Fromm so uh, easily pointed out decades ago, as being something that we accept as a matter of human nature. No, human nature has evolutionary potential. We can be more than we are and better than we are. But it's something that we have to do. We are conscious co-creators of our own existence. And we have, we have this, this sense of our ability to go way beyond we, who we are, to be more than we are and better than we are. Not, quality, not quantitatively, but qualitatively. And that is about a, a transformation in consciousness. It's, it's the integration of, 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 of spirit, of nature, of the physical world, of our personal world. But what happens? We miss that, and so we move towards destruction. Uh, if you look at, at, the, at, the, at the whole idea of destruction of, let's say, the destruction of an atom bomb, you know, splitting of the atom, the forces that impinge on that atom, the, the, the fission or fusion process that, that produces an explosion. Uh, you see forces coming in and matter gone, dis dis disintegration. And we're left with a void. The center does not hold. The center particularly can't hold if you blow it up. <laughs> Fundamental rule physics. So, so we're now reaping a whirlwind of destruction because we believe we don't have any control. We don't have control over the weather, but guess what? Man-made activity creates weather. Hello? Um, we don't have any control over war, but who creates war? Um, we, we, we have to come to an understanding that there is a connection between what's innermost and what's outermost. That the interpersonal conflicts that we have are wars in a microcosm. And if we don't manage those well in our own lives, they become wars in a macrocosm. 
There, there is a rather intricate physics in this, my friends. So when I say, as we choose, so chooses the world, it's, you know, I really believe that. I mean, there is, there, there is this exquisite connection of, of, of the chain of causality. You remember the observation that uh, a butterfly moving its wings on the other side of the world can create vibrations that can be felt in our, in our time space, really. See, we, we sell ourselves short on the issue of what's out there and what's in here. But when we come to understand that we are thinking our thoughts, our words, and our deeds have, have a unitary impact on the external reality. Things start to change. This was Heisenberg's thinking. You know, you observe something, you change it by observing it. We have the ability, through our thoughts, to change the world. But we're stuck with negative thoughts and thoughts of destruction, and so we end up with, with violence against each other, Violence in society, violence we're told is out of control, people being shot and killed all across the country on a daily basis. We're told we don't have any control at all, as if we don't have the ability to evolve. We're at war with the planet itself, with the fracking, the drilling, and the mining. We're told it has to be that way. We're at war with our agriculture, with GMOs that change the very nature of food itself. We don't have any choice, we're told. The FDA 20 years ago said genetically modified organisms are the functional equivalent of conventional food. Really? Really? Who made, who made that decision? Monsanto's contributions? See, we, are, we have a, a... We have a, a, a consciousness in our country which is uh, being misshapen by cupidity and by stupidity. Um, we are seeing uh, an economy which is dedicated to the destruction of nature itself. And then people step back and bemoan the destruction of the natural world. A policy which builds nuclear weapons or leaves them extant without any effort to understand that, it's, that the maintenance of those weapons itself represents an entire threat to not just our society, but society all over the world. So there is a connection. Follow this. The degradation of the global climate, which threatens life on the planet, and your uh, <coughs> nuclear weapons existence, which threatens life on the planet. Where did we get into this dilemma that we can have uh, these two conditions? that cause us to be put in such jeopardy. And I tell you that it's a type of thinking that, that tells us, well, we don't have any other alternatives it's the way it has to be. And, and, and so we, we are in a, a long, slow slide towards ecocide, towards the destruction of this natural world, towards the destruction of the planet. Because the preconditions are there right now. Uh, as, as the poet uh, Eliot talked about, shoring fragments against the roots in the wasteland. We, we are uh, becoming as architects of our own wasteland. But it doesn't have to be that way. We have to move from uh, disunity and destruction to construction. We have to create a new paradigm, one of integrative thought. One which countenances and truly understands the essential interconnectedness of all beings. This can be our future, one of cohesion. One of cooperation. One of coherence. One where we, by changing our thinking, we change the outcome. One of building new structures. Build new structures. One of transformation. So, we, 
So we seek the truth. We're told if we know the truth, the truth shall set us free. We seek the truth, and we're told by the philosopher Thomas Berry that the reconciliation of ourselves with the natural world is the greatest work of our life. We seek the truth, and we seek to act upon that truth. We seek to affirm human unity through diplomacy and treaties. We seek to affirm our right to live in peaceful communities through the work that Barbara Lee and I have done together for years and she will carry forward, Department of Peace Bill. We seek an at one -ment. a different construction, a different inflection on that, an at one -ment. as citizens of the world, where we can celebrate our, our common humanity. Over the entrance to the Capitol in Washington, D.C., there is a uh, statue of uh, the goddess of peace, whose arm is outstretched, and she is protecting a child who is sitting blissfully next to a pile of books. Now this, this beautiful work of art, which is above the entrance to the Capitol, an art by uh, uh, the sculptor Paul Whelan, is called Peace Protecting Genius. The goddess of peace protecting the child genius, not with nuclear arms, but with the arm of maternal love. Does that child have the opportunity to, to grow? Does that child have an opportunity to participate in the light which is on a stanchion right next to him? That that child does not have to do duck and cover drills. That that child does not have to worry about being in a world where the oceans are rising and the earth is trembling and the air is choking human beings' lungs that we are on the threshold, not of the dawn of destruction, but of the dawn of construction, of the dawn of integration, of the dawn of fashioning a new world. The poet Tennyson wrote, come my friends, Come, my friends, tis not too late to seek a newer world. This, then, is our work, to seek a newer world, to find a newer world, to fashion a newer world, and to start right here in the United States. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.